sound speeds. And if you operate wireless microphones in the UHF spectrum in the United States, then pay close attention because I'm going to introduce you to something that you might not have considered before, but you definitely should. And since this video involves a lot of things on the computer, let's waste no more time and jump right over there right now. The United States government keeps close tabs on and manages frequency use in the United States, not just by government entities, but by individuals as well. Now, if you get yourself a new cell phone, you may say, well, I don't have to manage the wireless on that. No, but you pay somebody like AT&T, T-Mobile, Verizon, something like that to manage the licenses on that. And you basically send data through that or make phones through the air using those frequencies. They're allocated for that particular use. If you had an old landline telephone that was operating in 900 megahertz, maybe two 2.4 gig that was allocated for that particular use. Your Wi-Fi allocated for a particular usage of, for, of a certain frequency range. If you had, for example, a ham radio, that's a different creature altogether. But the old-fashioned walkie-talkies that you might be able to buy off of Amazon now, well, those things are still out there, and those are allocated to use within certain frequency ranges as well. But the United States, when it comes down to management of frequencies, they have to keep a lot of things in mind. For example, that you know, just like with the audible frequency range, if you come up on a nightclub, for example, you're hearing a low bass, thud, 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 thum, thum, rumble, rumble, whatever the building happens to be shaking. But if you go on the dance floor, you might hear uh, music that's a little bass heavy, but you're still going to hear the mids and highs just fine. That's because the mids and higher frequencies don't travel through things like walls nearly as well as the bass does. Same thing happens in wireless communication. The lower the frequency is, the better it's going to travel through walls. And the higher frequency, of course, being that it's not like one wave traveling like this, like a lower frequency, there's going to be a lot of them. It will carry data much better at a higher frequency range. But that's the catch-22. It doesn't travel through wa walls nearly as well. Now, if you look at the U.S. Department of Commerce this frequency allocation table that they, that was released back in 2003, you're going to see a whole bunch of frequencies as it is laid out. And I'm going to zoom in here so I can show you a few things. Over on the left-hand side, it has a legend. And the ones that we're going to basically be looking at here is amateur, for example, and broadcasting. Those are basically the, the frequency ranges that you might be more used to. And the activity code, which is this little band that's at the bottom, if it is red, it's government exclusive use. If it's black, it's government and non-government shared use. And if it's kind of this green color, then it's non-government exclusive use. Now, this particular table covers the entire radio spectrum. I'll zoom in on this in a second so you can see it. But it starts here at 3 kilohertz and goes over to 300 kilohertz, then 300 kilohertz up to 3 megahertz. And every single one of these basically covers... 10 times the frequencies as the previous line, ending at 300 gigahertz. Now, let's go down here, for example, and, uh, well, actually, let's start here at the top since we're looking at it. Non-allocated up to about 9 kilohertz, but then notice that you get into maritime, mobile, and basically communication that would happen underwater. Well, aeronautical type things, remember, lower frequencies are going to travel through surfaces better, like, for example, water is going to travel through better. And when you get up to the really higher frequencies, that's when you're going to get into space research, earth exploration, really high frequencies like that, uh, that carry a lot of data and don't have a whole lot between, you know, a tower that's pointing into outer space and outer space. There's not going to be a whole lot coming be between that to interrupt. Now, let's go ahead and just for the sake of it, since we're looking here at the spectrum, let's look at about 2.4 gigahertz wireless. And we're going to see how that uh, plays out here. 2.4 gigahertz is right in here. Look at this amateur and it's green allocation. This is one of the reasons why I don't, I'm not a huge advocate for professional wireless systems operating within those frequencies. No offense if you happen to be affiliated with one of the companies that does that. Now, let's scroll on up here and look at uh, 300. No, it's actually going to be on the same line. What do you know? This, so this is UHF right here, this entire uh, 3 gigahertz and starting at 300 megahertz. But if you go over here, remembering this is 2003, from about 512 up to about 700 and actually went above that, there were certain frequencies you could use for broadcast. And notice there is 608 to 614. There's this little band right here that has mixed government use in it. We'll come back to that here in a second. But notice 512 all the way, well, actually technically 470, if you look at that, this is still being used down here for broadcast all the way up to... Uh, above 800, actually, is what I remember some some frequencies going up to on wireless. 
but that was a long time ago. Some things changed throughout the years, and the FCC sold off certain frequency ranges to be used and reallocated for other purposes. Now, this here is uh, revised as uh, February 1st, 2021, so it's about 18 years later, and it is by no means as colorful, but it does have a lot of information there. We're going to scroll down to uh, page 38 to begin with, and that happens to be right here. Look over here. We're going to look at 2.4 gigahertz wireless, 2.4 up to about... 2.483.5, and that is, of course, it's listed here as amateur. Amateur usage right through there. There's RF devices. There's Those RF devices might be partially, uh, for example, broadcasting. You see how they're used for broadcast television channels and stuff. There's a lot of different allocations, amateur radio, this kind of thing. But keep in mind also, this is the same spectrum that's being used by your Wi-Fi routers. It's the same spectrum that's used by microwave ovens. There are certain frequencies that are being used in that, including your wireless that you would get if you got something like the uh, the Deity uh, Pocket Wireless System or the Rode Go 2 system, for example. Now, let's scroll up here to page 30, I believe it was, and look here at uh, 470 which is what is legal now. 470 to 608 is still being used for broadcasting, and you can see right here the different uses of that, that spec spectrum. And unfortunately, we lost some frequencies, for example, after, uh, what was it, June 12th, 2010, we lost above 700 megahertz. And if you look over here, there's above 608 frequencies, 608 megahertz frequency ranges were uh, reallocated and sold off after June, uh, July 13th, 2020, we had to, to abandon usage of those legally. Um, now, this here uh, talks a little bit about that. And by the way, I'm going to put links to all these pages down in the in, in the description below so you can check them out and read them if you'd like to. But back to the allocation table, what we can use and what we can't use. Our spectrum has shrunk quite a bit and we're no longer able to broadcast on nearly as much. Now, there is a frequency range up here uh, if we scroll down to a little bit more, 941 to 944, 940 to 960. Okay, you see how this is also being used as uh, broadcast. It says auxiliary. It's still, it's a, it's a been able to be reallocated and we're allowed to use a little piece of it. And I'll, I'll show you basically the way that breaks down. Um, there is a cheat sheet, the FCC.gov website did put out all about operating within the license frequency ranges and stuff regarding the duplex gaps and the 600 megahertz frequencies. Duplex gap, let me get into that. We're now back on the 2003 colorful map, so I can kind of help you visualize a little better. Between 470 and 608, that's the legal spectrum now. That is still being used by us, but above 608, that is no longer able to be used by us. So this entire frequency range is no longer available to us legally. Now, if you look at this little gap right here, this is what's known as a guard band. It protects usage from 5G, which is the area that's now being used above that. That's what got sold off and no longer is allocated to us as of July 13, 2020. That is in that area. 5G had to come from somewhere, didn't it? So they decided to sell off some of the spectrum that we used and reallocate it for, uh, for 5G right there. But this little area here that guards between what we use in broadcasting, television, film, that kind of thing, and 5G, there's a little band of 6 megahertz that's known as the guard band that prevents bleeding between those frequency ranges. Now, there's also in the middle here known as something called the duplex gap. That is the the right here on this Audio-Technica page. It, it shows it very well. The duplex gap is between cellular download and cellular upload. So if you look right here, that little gap does the same thing, prevents bleed. So that way, that's a protected area. However, if you happen to get a FCC license, known as a Part 74 FCC license, for example, you can operate inside of this frequency uh, gap and others. And Gotham Sound did a great job of putting together a little cheat sheet for why you should actually get a Part 74 license. Read along with me. A Part 74 license gives the wireless mic operator priority over unlicensed operations, the use of power up to up to 250 milliwatts, the ability to reserve channels, and access additional frequencies. We strongly recommend applying for one. And there's additional information down here that you could read if you would like to. Now, what this basically means is that, it, not like if you go into a venue like 
NHL or NFL or MLB, something like that, one of these big sports venues, you can't just suddenly say, I'm a license holder. I got to use my wireless here. That's a particular venue. They definitely uh, can trump you on this one. But if you happen to be on a film set and you have a certain frequency range and other unlicensed users come in there and they're using the same frequency range, you could technically and legally say, look, I'm a Part 74 license holder by the FCC. I'm allowed to use these frequencies before you. You're not, probably not going to make very many friends if you do that, but it is something you're legally allowed to do. Just like you would be able to legally say, if we're going to be shooting at this particular location on this particular date, I'm going to register those frequency, certain frequencies to be used in that, in that, so that way um, you can make sure you can use them for a particular shoot you're doing. Now, how do you go about getting a license? Well, if you click on the little uh, 695 guide down there, you are taken to IATSE Local 695's website. That's the California local for sound mix. Now, if you want to apply for a license for use in television or film, there are certain qualifications and stipulations, of course, and when you start to go through that, the FCC will say, does this apply to you? Does this apply to you? If they do, you can follow this, this little guide here and learn exactly what you need to do and how you need to do it. And you can have a professional do it for you, but that's going to make that $170 license fee quite a bit higher, maybe another 100 or so. But it's actually very easy to do when you follow the step-by-step -step instructions, which if you start going through it, for example, it talks about everything you need to do. It talks about all the details, and then it walks you through screenshots of the FCC's website and what you need to do, how you need to take the buttons, and what you need to, to do in order to apply for a license for use for television and film. So it's definitely something you should strongly consider doing. And if you look over here, this is my actual FCC license. Now, my name is on the Internet Movie Database, so you can see my entire name, woohoo, yay, public records. But I have redacted some of it and blurred it out so that way you can't see things like my call sign, for example, my address, this kind of thing. But you can see that I am licensed to operate with an LP, Broadcast Auxiliary Low Power, license. And it talks about the frequency ranges I'm allowed to use and how many units I can operate within those frequency ranges, what power I'm allowed to use, and... It has all the different pertinent information you would need to know if you were w wanting to look at my my FCC license here. So that is my Part 74 license and why I think you should get them. And I strongly recommend if you use UHF frequencies at all for wireless. That means if you get yourself something off of Amazon, if you buy yourself a, a used G4 wireless system even, or a brand new WYSICOM, Zaxcom, Electrosonics, uh, Axient system, something like that. If you get yourself anything and you're using it professionally as someone in either corporate events, if you're doing, uh, you know, uh, uh, a corporate video, if you're doing film and television, if you do even you know, anything at all within that frequency range, I strongly recommend getting a Part 74. It's not that expensive to get, and it's even a tax write-off. And best of all, the license is good for eight years after you get it. So I strongly recommend getting it. Follow the links down in the description if you would like to follow these steps and learn all about the different things between duplex gaps and guard bands and the frequency uses and license versus unlicensed operations. Thank you for turning into this episode of Soundspeed. Be sure to tune in the future for more things you should do and sound advice. Have a question you'd like answered or want to add something? Be sure to write it in the comment section down below. You can also make a suggestion for future topics of discussion. Again, comment section down below or you can email me at soundspeeds at yahoo.com. Be sure to subscribe and turn on notifications so you won't miss out on future sound advice.